Good afternoon, sir. Can you tell you, me your name and your profession? My name is Hal Buell. I was uh, in charge of AP Photos and I'm now retired from that job. But I worked in uh, Japan for AP and did a lot of coverage and a lot of photo reporting in the Southeast Asia back in the early 1960s and late 1950s. Wonderful. So you were an editor uh, for those company during the Vietnam War? Yes, I was. I was in charge of AP from 1967 until the end of the war mm. out of New York at that time. So um, what exactly uh, an editor um, doing, a photo editor doing? Well, the pictures come in from all over the world and they come into New York. And in New York, uh, we have a, had and do, still do have a, a large picture desk with many editors. And we edit the different photo selections for regional coverage and for national coverage. And Asian material would come into New York and then be passed on to Europe. Europe material would come into New York and be passed on to Asia. And the desk, the desk manages all that. We had uh, in those days and still today, we had uh, almost 30 editors working just in New York on photos. And a staff of photographers besides that. Wow. At that time, we don't have internet like we do now. We mm. cannot push a button. So how do they transport all the photo to you? No, it, no, you're right. The internet now is so different, and it was so different then. When pictures came into the United States from Vietnam, they came in on radio circuits. There were no landlines and no digital satellite transmissions. There were radio beams that were monitored in San Francisco and New York. Oh, wow. Or sometimes in Manila and relayed on to San Francisco, or sometimes in Tokyo. <laughs> sometimes radio circuits to Frankfurt. They came in from all different ways, depending upon the availability of the circuits. And the circuits were very difficult circuits. They were very, we call shaky circuits. And the, the pictures were damaged in the transmission. So they did not look as good as you would like. But that was the only way to get pictures out of Vietnam same day, the today's picture today. So what we used to do is we would send some few pictures by radio and then we prepared picture selections in Vietnam and we put them in FedEx and DHL right directly to New York and then we would put the pictures on the network in New York by putting them on a transmitter drum and transmitting them from New York. So we had two ways, radio coming in and picture packages coming into New York. Wow, so a lot of work, a lot of people involved? Yes, it was very labor intensive, yes. Yeah. Imagine now they you just need a few people, one put and then one receive over here, isn't it? Well, it's, it's changed so much. In those days, we could only send each day, we could only send a hundred or so pictures per day to American newspapers. Mm. Nowadays, they send two or three thousand mm. every day, just AP, then Getty and Reuters and others. So there are many, many more pictures available now. But in those days, Maybe each day we would send five or six or seven Vietnam pictures, unless some big story like Tet Offensive, we'd send more, and other big stories we'd send more, but mostly it was five or six or seven a day on Vietnam. Okay. Uh, so, um, how many guys out there are sending pictures to you? I mean, how many report or photograph? We had, we had a staff in, uh, we had a photo staff in Vietnam working out of Saigon and Da Nang of uh, 12 people. Wow. Yes, we had three or four editors and seven or eight photographers, plus many, many freelancers and stringers who would make pictures and bring them to us. Maybe we'd buy, maybe we wouldn't. It would depend on the pictures. Uh, what kind of category you base on to pick this picture but not that? Well, it, there are many considerations. First, the news value of the picture. Is this an important event that happened? Um, so sometimes we would make a picture of the president of Vietnam or we'd make a picture of a major battle from Vietnam or Buddhist demonstrations. There were so many at that time in Vietnam, a Tet Offensive. It would depend on the, uh, the news value of the picture and also the content of the picture. Sometimes a picture would be so dramatic of itself, like a combat war picture, that you'd use it just because it was a, wonder, a marvelous picture. So there are, those are, there's a scale of values that are applied to the picture. So many different categories. In many categories, yes. Uh, so when you said that the value of the picture, you're talking about um, the the news people want to hear or what kind of value we're talking about here 
Well, if, if there was, let's say there was a coup d'etat against the president, well, that would be a major political development. Right. So you'd want pictures of the president, you'd want pictures of the people who performed the coup. Yes. If there was a bombing uh, of a restaurant, that would be an important news story because maybe many people were killed, some Americans, many Vietnamese usually is the way that works, mm -hmm. and where that turned out, and so you'd want pictures of that. And sometimes you would just want an interesting picture of Vietnam. It wasn't just war. You would, you would do pictures in the countryside, we would do pictures of uh, Tet celebrations before the big Tet Offensive and in the previous Tet's uh, holiday celebrations, and uh, all ma uh, just all kinds of photographs of all different subjects. You were there in 67, uh, so the, the time that uh, Eddie Adams, uh, the very famous photographer... That was in 68, actually, 68, Nine, yes. in, fe in uh, February, early February, February 1st of 1968. So you were a chief... Um, I was in New York at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you received that, what went in your mind? And then I, I guess you, you pick it up right away? Oh well, yes, it came in by radio, because mm -hmm. it's a very, very important picture. It came in immediately by radio. And um, we would always discuss very briefly the value of the picture, and obviously this was going to be an important photograph. And so it was transmitted very quickly to American newspapers and then transmitted on to Europe for European newspapers, also to South America, sometimes back to Asia also. And the, uh, we knew that there would be some negative reaction to the picture. The picture became controversial because it's because we you know in the United States we had two f factors we had the conservative people who, who were we call them hawks and then we had the more liberal element we call them doves they didn't want the war the conservatives wanted the war and when that picture came in the um, <clears throat> the doves the more liberal people felt that the picture showed a brutality of of action that was unacceptable and they capitalized on that. The conservatives said this was this was war and this this man had killed many uh, Vietnamese. He was an assassin among other things. He had killed uh, the aide to Lo General Loan who did the, who did the shooting actually. So you had these two reactions and the impact of the picture was that people who couldn't decide whether they were hawk or dove some jumped and became doves, and, and others became more conservative. But many people who couldn't decide were moved into one camp or the other by the impact of the picture uh, on the public. Yeah. So, um, um, many uh, historians said that American and South Vietnam won the battle of Hue. We could compare uh, the loss from both sides. Um, I think uh, Viet Cong VC uh, got 15,000 killed and kicked out of the city. And then uh, American and uh, South Vietnamese about over 5,000, not including civilians. Um, so we won the battle. Uh, well, the, con said. the consensus um, at first, the first reaction was that the North Vietnamese in the Viet Cong could put together such a major operation that hit so many different cities, including Saigon. That was a surprise. Although they knew a major attack was coming, it was a much larger attack than, than the Americans or the South Vietnamese thought. But the response was very strong. The American response was strong and the South Vietnamese army was very strong. And in the end, it was a major loss to the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. They lost many, many, many people and the whole infrastructure of their military operation was weakened. But, but the, the overriding response and belief was that, that, that this, this operation was launched, even though it was a military defeat for the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Um, it, was a, it was a propaganda win, sort of, for them. I see. Uh, so, um, the, uh, execution um, picture, photo, uh, that uh, Eddie Adams did, uh, took it in uh, Cholon, Saigon. Cholon, yeah. Uh, and in uh, Hue, uh, I think uh, American Marines and other were sent in to fight, uh, to fight the war. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as you may know that um, many Vietnamese civilians 
would kill uh, some ear, some evidence, so that they may be buried alive. Uh, do you see any picture of those? I never saw or heard of any pictures like that. But many uh, Vietnamese, uh, I guess more Chinese in Cholon, because a lot of the fighting in Saigon was in Cholon, and it was urban warfare. And urban warfare is is really very very deadly because people can't get away and they get caught in the streets of the city and the the armies both sides come in with these very heavy like tanks and rocket you know rocket launchers and a lot of civilian people get caught in that and were and were killed that's true that, that did happen yeah yes sir but I uh, over months ago I uh, interview uh, um, Colonel he now retired mm -hmm. his name is Chuck um, Meadows mm -hmm. he was sent into uh, uh, Hue on uh, January the 31st of 1968, mm -hmm. right early, um, you know, Tet offensive in, uh, you know, the, the, the attack, uh, you know, Hue city at that at that time, and he was there uh, with his, um, you know, I think that uh, company, uh, he had about over 100 men, mm -hmm. and fought. So he was there and he fought all the way to until Hue was liberated, and he was there and he witnessed. Uh, people digging out of the grave because mass grave that have bodies of people mm. were shot, killed, and he also have a list of people that the Viet Cong came in with a list, and that list is very detailed. Like meet the Nguyen Van A at uh, near the bridge, and if you go to the right, and his home is the third home from that intersection. So they have a list to come in and hunt. Uh, so um. In your long time, wonderful career, which picture you have picked and you still very satisfied with that? Uh, well, in, in, the, in the Vietnam, whole Vietnam experience, there were three very important pictures. One was the immolation of the monk in, uh, by Malcolm Brown. The second was Eddie Adams' picture and the third was Nick Hutt's picture. Those are the three icons, we call them icons, the photo icons of the war. And in addition, there were many other pictures there. Uh, Horst Foss uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the Vietnamese army early uh, he, for 1964 pictures. It were almost all Vietnamese army pictures. And they were marvelous, marvelous photographs. Um, he had 20, uh, 20 photograph portfolio. And um, it, it it's just every picture was a stunning, a very unusual, and very dramatic picture. Um, <clears throat> then um, Kiyoshi, Kiyoshi Sawada of, uh, of United Press International made pictures of a Vietnamese family in a river under fire. That was a very dramatic picture that I remember and it was opposition, but it was a marvelous picture. Uh, Eddie did, uh, in addition to uh, the picture we know of, the site of the execution picture, he did pictures, there was a picture of, of American troops advancing in front of uh, civilians with their children, which was very dramatic. I remember that very clearly. There was a picture made by Eddie up in Pleiku, where the last helicopter out of that camp, Eddie was in it, and a woman with her wounded husband, Vietnamese woman with her wounded Vietnamese husband, who was a, a paramilitary, uh, wanted to, was pleading, please get me on the helicopter. And there was no room. You know, cause this wasn't any room, and the helicopter had to take off. And that really that hurt Eddie. And there was another marvelous selection of pictures that Henri Hewitt, who was an AP photographer who was half Vietnamese and half French, uh, who he made pictures of a medic uh, in a battle with the eye patch. Maybe you remember the picture. He had a he had, the medic had been wounded, and even wounded, the medic continued to help the other GIs that were wounded. That was in Life magazine. That was a marvelous photograph. Larry Burroughs did a series of pictures for Life magazine called Yankee Papa 13, which was the story of a helicopter mission that went bad. And that was a very dramatic, 13 pages in Life magazine. So those are some of the things, as you say, you know, the wonderful pictures that come to my mind. And, uh, but, but something that, um, it, it's, it's, it's not known by lay people, it's known by the photo world, but not by lay people. 
Vietnam War was covered like no other war before and no war since because the photographers had access to the battles through the helicopter system. It, 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 there was no censorship and in fact the U.S. military made a positive effort to help the American correspondents cover the war. So if an American correspondent or photographer heard of a battle of some city or some town, he could just go out to the airport and go down the line, where are you going, are you going, oh I'm going to get wounded or I'm taking ammunition in, can I come along, hop on the helicopter and off they went. So it's just instant, they were acting. Like I said before the Viet Cong, you couldn't get to the, what the Viet Cong were doing, by the time you got there it was gone. In the case of the other side, the helicopters took the photographer right in. And he was there right in the middle of the battle. It, there was a big famous battle at Dong Zai uh, that, of course, Foss covered. He, he was almost killed because they got right into the, the helicopters, landed right in the middle of the battle on a, on a football field, a soccer field. And uh, the pictures were just unbelievable. You just, we never saw war pictures like that from Korea or World War II. And we haven't seen pictures like that from the Iraq and Afghanistan. There have been a lot of wonderful pictures from Iraq and Afghanistan, but not like Vietnam and not in the volume. So many pictures, day after day after day, there were all these pictures, plus the television covers. Yeah. So the people saw the war differently from Vietnam and other war. Iraq photo covers was very different than Vietnam. Because so, because the correspondents and photographers will become embedded with a unit. That means they went with that unit and they had to stay with that unit. Now, they couldn't wander around anyway because it was very dangerous. The correspondents and photographers were being murdered in, in, uh, in Iraq just because they were correspondents. So you, you, you needed to be with the military for protection, but you had to stay with the military. That meant you stayed with that military, and if you heard of a battle over here, you couldn't jump over there. But in Vietnam, you go with a unit and nothing happened, and just walk into the jungle. All of a sudden you hear of a battle, hop, I don't ride a helicopter to that battle. So, so the photographer's motion, movement, in Iraq was very tight and limited. In Vietnam, no limit. Go anywhere you want. So that's why there was so much more coverage from Vietnam as opposed to Iraq. Yes, they said but there was no there was no censorship as such in Iraq. Yes. People sent, the correspondents and photographers sent whatever pictures or stories they wanted. They just didn't have the access to do this large volume of pictures. Uh, so, like uh, you men have mentioned, it Vietnam War was the one of the most do documented war yes. in history. Absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, somehow, uh, the South Vietnamese. Uh, still didn't have enough coverage. Like I mentioned, for instance, the, the killing of over 5,000 people, and then we have... Um, look, look, I don't know about that, so don't keep asking me about it. Yeah. I, don't, I can't answer the question for you. Okay. As much as I'd like to, I just can't. I'm not familiar with what you're yeah. talking about. I, I don't ask you about that, but I want to ask you the next question. Is um, some, some people said that uh, Vietnam War we lost because uh, many things, including uh, you know, some corruption from South Vietnamese government, uh, from uh, you know the tire of the public for a bloody uh, war, uh, and uh, some people even say that because of uh, um, you know the the unfairly report and that that don't present it to the public. So at the time when they saw their children die over there, the war getting so taking so long, uh, you know, exhaust everything. And then finally American uh, have to leave and uh, when uh, South Vietnam need help the most, uh, didn't have it so that end the way it, it was. So what do you think about the outcome of the Vietnam War? So, the outcome? The outcome. What, the end, it, it, the way it ends. Well, it ended. I don't know. I don't know how to respond to that. I'm glad the war ended. We didn't kill anybody anymore. We, God knows, enough people died there. Fifty-eight thousand Americans died there. How many a million or more Vietnamese died? It was a bloody war, and uh, the uh, it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And you're right. The American people got a little tired of the war. You know, it became a political issue in the United States, and uh, it. Uh, 
it, beyond that, I don't know what to say. That, yeah. that ended. Yeah. The Americans pulled out. Yeah. Everybody was happy because the war stopped and uh, not many killing uh, uh, doing in Vietnam anymore. But uh, for Vietnamese people, after the war, even the peace came, uh, people got killed. Uh, yes. Over one million of uh, South Vietnamese uh, officer and uh, old government officer. Uh, or people don't agree with them, go put in a prison across the country. Well, I've heard and read stories about that, but again, I have no personal knowledge of that. Yes. And also, people have to fled the country, like myself, mm -hmm. uh, escape, and um, they and, um, you know, uh, official, um, you know, um, records uh, of uh, from United Nations, uh, over 500,000 uh, Vietnamese, uh, both people drowned on the sea. Mm. And ocean, so uh, people thinking about ending the war that way, uh, you know, it's just uh, like a surrender to a, uh, you know, um, the force um, that uh, not famous with Vietnamese people. Uh, they w we wish that the war ended and win by Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, and American. Um, you have any comment on that? No, I can't. Nothing I would say about that. Okay. Um, overall. Um, what do you think about um, the Vietnam War, your memory, and uh, and whatever that I don't didn't ask you yet, <laughs> whatever thinking and feeling I didn't ask you about, can you share? Oh no, I don't know. You seem to cover you covered the things I can most I can address, yes. which are the photo coverage and the pictures that came from Vietnam. As far as the greater political issues, you have to talk to somebody who really is more knowledgeable about all the various political business that went on. I can't testify to corruption or lack of corruption in the, in the Vietnamese government. I suppose it was corruption, but I don't know. I have no documentation on it. I don't know. I can't say one way or the other. So as a young man in Japan, sit there and see the whole war unfold in front of you, what was you thinking at that time? Was it interesting? You like it? I mean, yeah, uh -huh. no, I don't think anyone likes war. Yes, These are things that the media would cover, like we do in Iraq and Afghanistan and World War II and Korea. The media in the United States has always covered things like that. Sometimes when the United States is not even involved, there are rebel operations in the other areas of the world, Africa and so on, and the American media covers it as part of uh, the flow of information in our society. Beyond that, I see it as a journalistic duty to cover war as, as it happens, wherever it happens. Eddie Adam did a wonderful thing by doing the No Smile, um, you know, collection. Uh, the what collection? Uh, the bow of No Smile. Oh yes, the bow of No Smile. Yes, uh, he feel a little responsible for his photo, uh, you know. Um, he think that he maybe contribute some uh, in, uh, you know. Uh, he even say in one his documentary, he said that my photo uh, kill uh, a Yeah, the there. photos, the photos that he did were um, brought to the attention of the Carter administration, <laughs> and uh, they were part. Of, there was a there was a pressure at the time to open up uh, to a greater immigration of uh, South Vietnamese people, <laughs> and the pictures came at a time that was critical to the voting of that and they, they were there's no question that those photos had a had an mm -hmm. impact and made it easier for that law to be passed and to expand the uh, the number of people that were allowed to come in no question of it yeah. wonderful so um you think that uh, we think or you think that any uh, photographer uh, have, have to feel that way and do that way? Or is that your yes, it, it, yes, I think any photographer would do it, but it, once again, it was very difficult to find the boat. You, you, a lot of the boats in that area were fishing boats, just fishing boats. Okay. And, and, but there were also mixed in there people who were escaping. And to find the right one was difficult. And Eddie, Eddie got onto the story. He read something in the newspaper here, and he went to Thailand, and the Thais wouldn't it wouldn't let the Vietnamese in. And he he just happened to go to the Thai maritime police at the at the moment when there was a ship in dock, and he bang got right onto it, 
he bought some rice, he bought some gasoline, they helped the people and they took him on board and off he went. And that's, that's how it happened. It, it wasn't luck, but luck was part of it. He, he could have spent six months trying to find a boat and not find one. He'd find a fishing boat or whatever. And of course, there were, Eddie was worried because there were a lot of pirates in, the, in that area at the time. And they would, what they would do is they'd attack the boat, they'd kill all the people, they'd take whatever was taken. And there he was. And then the, the maritime police came back out and ordered him off the boat. And those people eventually were rescued, you know. Yes. And they live in the Midwest somewhere now, I believe. That's what I heard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So can you make comment about the power of the picture? Well, the pictures were very good. I mean, you've seen them. Yeah. I mean, they really showed refugees. And Eddie was a marvelous photographer. I mean, he, he knew how to make a, make the picture that's right to show up. So he had, there were four or five pictures that were very strong. And then there were supporting pictures, the boat and the water and, you know, the various, and any kind of a selection of photos, there are usually four or five that are really wonderful photography. And then there are pictures that support the wonderful photography. And he, you know, he was just very good at his job. He did a complete job. The pictures were transmitted on the AP wires, and he wrote a story called The Boat of No Smiles. And it, uh, it came to the, like I said before, it came to the attention of the Carter administration. And it ended up into Congress also, and some other senators saw it. And, and it, it had, no doubt it had an impact on getting the law passed. It opened up the immigration numbers. Are you, you were having uh, the uh, chance to talk to Eddie during that time? Oh, yeah, sure. Did he say anything to you about the no smile, or the bow of no smile yeah. in the collection? Oh, yeah. What did he say? Oh, he was happy he did it because, you know, Eddie didn't like the Loan picture. He, he was very negative about that. He felt it, it, it was a, he'd done a bad thing to Loan. And, and he felt that, that somehow the bow of no smiles picture is compensated a little bit for that. And, he often said he wished that he'd won his Pulitzer Prize for the Boat of No Smiles and for the Luan picture, because he felt the Boat of No, the Boat of No Smiles picture had a positive impact on people's lives, particularly the immigrants who, who were allowed in. And so he was, he was very, uh, you know, very satisfied with that set of pictures. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you want to say anything else now? No, I can answer your questions as much as I can. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for okay. your kindness. I'm sorry about some time. I asked you again about the question, but because of those the things that we need to find out. Yeah, well, there are some things I can help you with and some things I can't. So okay. when I can't help, I will say what I have to say, and otherwise I say, I'm sorry, I can't, okay. can't respond because I don't know. Okay.